Tape Projection. Hey everyone, we had a week off, but here we are. We are taking it down the Southern Analytical Slack of Pretension podcast about pop culture. I'm the host, Blaine Duncan. I'm also curious about why I like what I like and why I hate what I hate. I'm also an English teacher, and I'm a kid who grew up in front of a television set, so my analysis skills are about as good as they could be. Plus, I have an erudite musician with me as well as a media specialist slash film buff each week to help me take all this down. This episode of Taking It Down, you're going to get conversations on the big event releases from Netflix and Disney Plus, respectively. Their Obi Wan Kenobi, is it worth the wait? I call him Old Ben Kenobi, still a thing. Old habits, dying hard and whatnot. Uh, does Stranger Things 4 hold up against its predecessors? We'll answer those questions and more. Uh, Stranger Things being the TV show that kicked off our first podcast way back in 2019, which that seems nowhere near as long as it should be. You are itching for your friends and your coworkers to watch these shows and talk to you about them or look no further. Here we are for you. In order for, uh, for me to do all that stuff and get my thoughts straightened out each week, I got a crew. Uh, only one today, though. The erudite musician I mentioned briefly. <laughs> we usually have Donovan. Uh, he's been compromised, so instead I'm going to give my co-host a sincere introduction. I usually joke with about these a little. Uh, you can find his work as a musician with Speckled Bird Online. And his work as a community organizer to a degree, if he doesn't mind me saying that, with Coda Chrome Gardens online. You can find him there too, he and his wife. Search that out, Coda Chrome Gardens, especially if you're in the Northeast Alabama area. He's Adam Morrow. Here he is. Good to be here, Blaine. I miss Donovan's yeah. lean in and his great to be back or whatever his NPR mm-hmm. voice that he puts on. But hey, we're going to soldier on without him. Well, for the sake of sincerity, our other co-host is Donovan, Ryan Walden. He's one of the brightest and wittiest minds we both know, I guess, especially when it comes to film, I think. Would you agree with me? Yeah, absolutely. Film, literature, music to a large degree, That's too. True. If he's If he's into something, he's encyclopedic about it. And uh, on occasion, if you're new to us, on occasion, we do have our one of our other co-hosts is Natalie Morrow, and she joins us often. She's got uh, her bitter, sarcastic, and truly hilarious takes on <laughs> film and tv and she's really our marvel and harry potter and lord of the rings she's our yeah. go-to for she's the ringer to bring in yeah she sure is we're happy to have her when she does join the show she'll join us in future episodes certainly it's a wonder she didn't today but so i'm getting the vibe adam that we might have some new listeners this week. just a vibe i'm feeling it out well welcome yeah welcome people we don't want to bog the show down let's get into it we start every week with the done up real good listener of the week. I'm gonna give it to someone who does not deserve it, but here we are. Maybe he does deserve it. He's author, legendary author in the Alabama Southeast area, founder of the site, but long gone. It's Caleb R. Johnson, listener of the week. We could golf clap for him. Yeah. Caleb. Caleb probably listens sporadically. He did found the site, the Alabama Take. If you listen up until the break, I'll tell you more about that. But Caleb helped found the site way back when. He and I and TD would get credit, I suppose, for kickstarting this back in 2008, 2009 or something. Before we get into being very, very deeply, we'll do some cursory thoughts. Let's wrap our conversation on Russian Doll. I didn't mention it in the mm-hmm. intro, so we mm-hmm. won't take long. It's second season. You and I both wrapped this not too long ago, though we were off last week, so we didn't get a chance to expand on it. When we first talked about it, we'd only watched three episodes, but we both finished the season. What did you end up thinking of it as a whole? The last, I think I even texted you about it, and the last thing you told me was that you were just going to hold off until you wrapped that final episode. I think, you know, we both enjoyed the first season quite a bit. Uh, and I, a lot, if we're, yeah. if, if we're going to compare them out of the gate, I think the first season was better, but season two, you know, it's, it's funny when a show is so surreal and so, uh, about an idea that it works through that idea in season one. And then season two, it's like, well, what do you do now? Do you develop characters? Do you pick mm-hmm. this other idea for something? Mm. I guess we'd call it supernatural, even though it doesn't. It's not presented as supernatural in the way, say, Stranger Things is that we're going to get into later, but... Not at all supernatural. 
how would how would you describe no, it? No, not in its presentation. No, no, no. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, agreeing yeah. with you that, that it was. I'm agreeing with you in it in that its presentation is not at all supernatural. It's very accepted about you know she's time traveling via train and it's just accepted yeah. right on the spot with her and Alan. She tells Alan and he's like he's basically like I don't want to do that. But then like the next episode, you can tell his expression is more like. Hmm, I want to check this out. Rather than, I don't believe you, or this is weird, or not true. And I guess that we can accept that because they laid the groundwork for the what the hell's happening in season one. That these are people who have been so far through it that they'll just accept anything the world Mm -hmm. has to throw at them at this point. Which we discussed, I think, when we talked about the first few episodes. Right. Even her friend accepts it. Sweet birthday baby. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's I'm I'm forgetting her name, but she's hilarious. I could have used more of her. Anyway, you were saying yeah. doing these ideas that, and they're not presenting them as incredibly supernatural, though they would be for anyone else. What did you think? They where were you going with this? Did you think they handled that well? I thought that the big ideas were super interesting. This uh, this idea of epigenetics, right? The the study yeah. of of plasticity of not only our own minds brains because i guess brain we're talking about a physical thing but that between generations it's possible for good and bad to be passed down you know when you bring that up and you're interested in that how you get there from there to like a fictionalized show i think this did it as well as anything could uh there were some Mm -hmm. moments that i found to be a little trite maybe at the end i'm a Always a big fan of big dramatic conclusions that include long surrealistic journeys. You know, when they go through the, the various train stations and then are in like a abandoned something, warehouse or something, or train station with all the water. And she has to, you know, when I say try it, I mean like when she has to let the money go, essentially yeah. let the, the family fortune go to get out. You kind of roll your eyes at yeah. that. But yeah, the big ideas I thought were pretty fun. Huge ideas, really in-depth ideas. You could tell Natasha Leon had read about these things and was interested in these things and wanted to apply them to the show. She said as much. I don't know what happened. Might have been COVID-related. They could have used a couple more episodes to apply these mm. huge ideas to Alan's story a little better. Mm. Yeah. Uh, he could He could have used another episode or two, and then they could have done the ending, and I think that would have hit harder. Because of that, I think it fell a little short of what episode, not episode, season one was able to do. Yeah, there may have been some pacing problems. Uh, when they go to Europe and back in one episode, that felt kind of... <laughs> 1940s Europe, right? Well, when they go in the modern day, when she's trying to, you know, she hides the money in the... There's a whole sequence where they like go yeah. and party with the the descendant of this guy who has potentially stolen the family riches and all See, of those. That's so rushed, I almost forgot. Yeah, it. yeah, that's all in like one less than a half hour episode. That all could have could have used some breathing room, probably. But I, I'm still a fan of the show. I would still recommend. Uh, yeah, and I think the first three or four episodes of this season was really really good, and then it, it started bumping up against some of those. I guess pacing problems kind of would encapsulate the, the issues. Still good, still well done. It, your mileage is going to vary on Natasha Leone, I think. I'm I okay like her. With her I like time. her. Yeah, I kind of like her. She does have this Fran Lebowitz kind of thing going. Yeah, yeah. Right? And we're big sure. fans of, of Fran. For sh- this show, taking it down, especially the Alabama Take, especially, are just fans of Fran Lebowitz. We've kind of established that. We're all in on what she she does. She's got that vibe, really. I, and anyway, so I wanted to ask Adam a little bit about their new Wilco album, but I think what we'll do is put that on pause. We'll table that one and come back next Tuesday. It wouldn't hurt to probably have Donovan in on that discussion, so maybe our listeners would want to join in and listen to that album, give it another week, soak it in, and we'll all talk and think about it. Wilco's new release is there anything that three white dudes north of 30 want to talk about more than the new wilco record i mean exactly we have a podcast uh <laughs> we <laughs> we are the audience for that for sure uh instead we'll segue by sticking with netflix that'll be a, a segue for us uh, another netflix show i guess their biggest one ever is this their biggest show ever netflix is i'm really interested things. in this and uh, we don't have to talk about what's happening with Netflix 
you know, in regards to the company itself and their stock and blah, blah, blah. But That's not our forte, nah. No, but how could they, looking back when it was always the, the streaming darling, the, the one at the forefront, and this show proved it, you know, several seasons in a row, and now they put this new season out in a very different atmosphere than they had in the past. Just interesting. Yeah, Stranger Things 4, first half of it, seven episodes is on Netflix, and the rest of it will be out on July 1st. Well, we're going to spoil at least two episodes of Stranger Things 4. That's a given. If you haven't watched the first two, you might want to duck out or use the show notes to fast forward to the next segment. So what'd you make of the return to Hawkins and some visits to 1986 California? Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this season yet. We're only two episodes in. That's what we chose to to bite off because they're they're pretty big episodes, which they've done in the past. You know, that's you feel like you're gonna watch an hour program, but it's really closer to an hour twenty. It's good to see it's good to see the team again. Good to see the crew. There's so much that to me bleeds together from season two and season three. Uh, and even their mm-hmm. their recap didn't make it totally clear what happened when, though I don't I don't guess that's important. You know, I know that Hopper's in Russia. They make it abundantly clear that some of the characters are in California now. We can get into it, but they the things that were hinted at for most of the earlier seasons, they kind of just open with now. Such as what? The supernatural happens almost immediately, which it which it did before. You know, in season one, it's a younger cast for sure, and there's like kind of a darkness in the woods, right, that develops and slow builds. And now, maybe part of it is that we just have to accept that we're in, we're with these characters in a reality where these things happen to them. And mm-hmm. even Dustin kind of says as much when he's talking to Eddie in episode two, like, you know, you think something weird happened? Try us. You know, mm-hmm. we may not be as surprised as you think. And but I like that. You enjoyed the the no no build up. Let's just get down to it. Nature of it. Yeah, yeah, for real. I, it's, I mean, because these are these are characters who've seen it. Like exactly like you're saying, it's not going to be. I'm gonna have trouble buying that they are sh- just shocked and astounded that something's happening. I don't think these characters have to be. Uh, and in fact, it's it's always funny when they, you know, kind of like like Harry Potter was just on cable this morning and of course Natalie had it on and in the middle of these year long battles that they have every school year with this you know evil the most evil wizard of all time they still like pause their research into that to play a quidditch match and in the same way that Dustin and his <laughs> the crew is kind of divided over who they fit in with in high school it's like you mm-hmm. guys have faced death Three times in a row now. I saw it. And you guys are concerned about like high school cliques. It's kind of always a funny suspension of disbelief that these people can even function as semi-normal teenagers. I don't know. I think that fits. I think that fits teenagers. We're taking opposing views on yeah. this. I think that fits. I think that's realistic for teenagers just to be really worried about the superficial, even if they have faced death a few times. To compartmentalize. Yeah. Uh, I'll break down some... Some things I re- still really dig those opening credits. If nothing else, this season encap- encapsulates being in a theater in the mid '80s. That it's those. It always has. I, I I think that Max, the young lady who plays it, Max, her acting has become two percent more subtle, which is I I joke, but at least she's understanding that acting with huge gestures is is for actual teens and not portrayals of one on television. So that's good. Yeah. I do think it's amusing that Eleven and Joyce now have the same hairstyle that they're living together. <laughs> that was kind of funny. <clears throat> uh, so we, we, we're getting the full Nightmare on Elm Street season in yeah. a way. I was banking on, hoping for pure horror and less sci-fi horror than the first three seasons were. We might be getting that, seems like it. When at the end of episode one, when Chrissy, the, the cheerleader who dies... When her bones crack in those sharp angles, mm. and her eyes sink into her head, I'm I'm like, oh yeah, this is what I was hoping for. This is where I I hope the this is what I hope was going to happen in that. I hope that the show was going to grow with its probably viewers. If it had a little bit younger skewed audience previously, you know what's what's going to scare them? What's going to scare the characters? 
what's going to freak them out more. And I think that would that would be it. That's your that's an okay starting point. Yeah, it definitely just leans directly into maybe that's what I was getting at is that there's no no build up to the horror that mm-hmm. you know there's the bone cracking stuff and the just the the full on terror of it almost immediately. Uh, they do some you know they have a basketball game and they have going to school in California and all that kind of stuff, but. It's they're not shying away, and then not to jump ahead to episode two, but say when they they try to enter the neighborhood and the cop stops them and things go south from there, mm-hmm. you know that that was so over the top to me and aggressive. But you're into these things. No, I no, think, no. I think the things that you're having issues with are things I'm going to bring up that I also have issues with as well. Okay, we'll and get there. Is, we'll get there. No, I, we're here. I think, which is. Have I come to a point with this series that I want any more from it? Like, do I think at this point with with Stranger Things, I want a lot less tropes and nostalgia and more depth and originality that would deepen the story. Mm. I'd much more prefer this reminds me of Nightmare on Elm Street or Carrie rather than this is taken straight from Nightmare on Elm Street and Carrie, you know? Like, how many times does this show want me to do the Leonardo DiCaprio meme where I point at the TV and I go, that's yeah. that's not Marilyn Elm Street. That's 1986, yeah. Friday the 13th, or whatever. It was great for a first season and a second season, but I think at some point this show has to take what was good and original and different and unique from, how many synonyms can I come up with, uh, from seasons one and probably two, and just... And, and go off that and grow with its characters. And it does a tiny bit, but it does it enough, I don't think, in these first two episodes. There's moments, you know, what I thought was the strength of the show to me was never the upside down or any of these things. Mm-hmm. It was the larger points about, say, in season one, about the pain of growing up and the pain of being 100%. different situation, being a kid without control and all this stuff. And. Even over these first two episodes of season four, it's like they try to manufacture some of those moments, uh, and mm-hmm. some hit and some don't. Say like, so like in the first episode, the tension of Lucas joining the basketball team and being apart in that way from the old crew is supposed to kind of maybe echo those mm-hmm. the pains of growing up thing that I talked about before, but it feels a little more forced than say. You know, when Eleven is going through what she's going through at her new school, that feels more intense and real in some ways. Elements of Wow. You think so? Because that, to me, felt so forced. It was way over the top, but okay. maybe it's a credit <laughs> to her as her acting ability that, you know, you really did feel for her, say, at the roller rink or uh, in those yeah. scenes, whereas yeah. the... And that that felt more like the what the show has done super well. The show has never been subtle about what it's doing. Well, so I'm fine with the a milkshake getting thrown. Okay, so I was wor- I was more worried about her in that. What is the show going to do to this character, and a lot less organically about the character in the show? Like, what are the writers mm. about to do? Uh, yeah. How far are they going to take this bullying? Because what they're doing is they're pulling straight from Carrie, and that got a little ugly because yeah. it's yeah. it's Stephen King yeah. can will do that, and they're trying to pull from some yeah. Stephen King. And I'm like, but you're Stranger Things, so what can you borrow from that without becoming a miming of it? I'll lay out my thesis of the first two episodes, and and then we'll break down some more stuff. Two episodes. My stance is this: it's basically as if they got together and said, "What if we do last season but darker?" And it's kind of a mimicry of itself. Mm. I'm very dissatisfied with it overall as a whole, though there are a few things that are okay with it. Let's start with this one. Where where are you with a lot of screen time devoted to the, to the new guy, Eddie? I always wonder about the behind the scenes. Like if you're if you're the actor who gets hired in to the fourth season of this incredibly successful show, and you walk on, and you know you're probably not in awe of being there, but you're still wondering like how do I fit in? with an already established thing that's going on, already established vibe. So that that keeps running through my head, and I liked Eddie. I think Eddie is hmm. better than... It, it could have gone worse than Eddie is going through two episodes. I mean, he's playing the... 
what is so he's flunked twice, which makes him pushing twenty years old <laughs> and hanging out with <laughs> high school freshmen. Is that right? Are we to believe and that he let is? Me, let me tell you something. There, if there is anything in this show that is true to nineteen eighty six, it is that. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me a lot in high school. Hanging out with twenty year olds. Oh yeah, because they had failed a, a time or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay then. But making Eddie, you know, he not only is the the Dungeons and Dragons guy, he has a band and he sells drugs. They're just kind of like, what what else can we throw at him that makes him the king of the, the oddball table in the lunchroom? Mm-hmm. Though his, you know, his opening spiel where he gets on the lunchroom table and carries on and all this kind of stuff, I was okay with that. You know, mm-hmm. but again, the show is an over-the-top program and it kind of needs that that element uh at times but you know i'm interested to see how he he got all his bravado out of the way Mm. in the first episode right because the end of that he's scared shitless he's hiding by what that time they find him in episode two he's quiet and almost unwilling to talk and they have to force it out of him so i it'll be the performance will be interesting going forward uh Mm -hmm. he may have just gotten all that you know, he only had 45 minutes to really let it fly. I say less time away from Stephen Robbins, friendship the worse. Having having a straight guy and a, and a not out lesbian in small town 1986 is the subplot I want. That's what that's the one I want to be <laughs> engaged with. That's real. Yeah. Here's what the show I think is doing. It's bumping up against. I think these kids are still freshmen, aren't they? Supposed to be that in the show. Yeah, because they keep talking about we just got to high school. They've got, they're bumping up against this heavily. I assumed that they were juniors. I thought they were just yeah. a year away from being seniors, and they were just t- uh, hanging out with Eddie, who is a senior. So, woof. That, it's bumping up against some of that, I think. This show also thinks I like Erica Sinclair a lot more than I do. <laughs> they tend to, when she's on screen, they want me to explode, I think, and I don't. Um, also, was ketamine a thing in small town? 1986 like could Eddie have really gotten <laughs> I, I wondered that yeah would she have been well versed in that I don't know and you know I suppose people don't float and, and cling to the ceilings except for that Lionel Richie documentary that was airing around that <laughs> uh episode two did bring to mind that uh, this is a problem I think I'm having too and it might be just a personal thing Eleven has has fallen for the douchiest guy of the gang and I do think that Will is starting to either realize this might be a true subplot that he too is, has fallen for the douchiest guy of the gang. Hmm. You think so? Yeah, I think so. It's it, uh, to some degree. It might be a, a bro crush or whatever you want to call it, a bromance, but it's still there. Well, he's uh, the the way that they treat him will be interesting since he's the one who has been through the most. Arguably, he's the only one that. You know, I joked early on in the segment about that they're able to just compartmentalize and go about their business, but he seems pretty permanently altered by that. Even the way that his family treats him is different from the other kids. You know, his brother's always trying to, when he, when he drops him off at the roller rink, he says something like, try to have a good time or hope you have a good time, something like that, like just almost willing this kid to actually be a kid. Yeah. So the older that Mike gets, do you not think that you may not like him, or is that just me? Maybe so. Um, I think the <laughs> other, the yeah, the other guys are more likable instantly, right? Yeah, uh, and continue yeah. to be. Dustin is still, you know, yeah. the same kid in a lot of ways, but they're also trying to paint Mike as kind of like a a little shit, confused fifteen year old. <laughs> Right? I guess. Yeah, exactly. You know, Dustin still works quite well for the show. Like, for example, they're trying their best to go for comedy with Jonathan's new weed friend, and it's not working for me. No. Because true, no, true comedy is Dustin banging on a door yelling, Reefer Rick. That's comedy. <laughs> trying to get Reefer Rick to come to the door. Yeah. Anything that involves Dustin going on his little his hunts like he is and picking up a new buddy, picking up Steve, you know, yeah. their ongoing, uh, buddy cop drama yes. is top and throw Robin in the mix. Still. And that's your, that's your spinoff. 
Dustin, Steve, and Robin. It's funny how much the show started with these four guys, and maybe they're doing it on purpose to mirror how adolescence works, but it's true. when they got in that video store and that crew was together, that was a lot more fun uh-huh. than any uh-huh. other assemblage so far. And it even made Max a lot more tolerable, though I think her acting is better. I think she grew as an actor. Yeah, she did some uh, some heavy lifting, Max yeah. did, in the first couple episodes. She was there quite a bit. She was okay. I long for the small town, non-franchised video store. There's a place, this is a super tangent, but somewhere in Indiana, if you get off an interstate in northern Indiana, you go into Michigan, I believe, pretty much as soon as you take the exit. (laughs) And we were driving in the van one time, and there was like like old fast food signs that hadn't been updated in 20 years and all this stuff, and there was a video store, I shit you not on the side of the just this a, four lane highway. Just a time warp. It felt like we had stranger things through some <laughs> or more appropriately, Russian dolled through time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think up until two years ago Arab had a video store. Wow. Just wow. probably so randomly uh not randomly, so infrequently visited. We're only two episodes deep. We might be making judgment calls that we can't quite make, but I will say that if they get more into this satanic panic stuff, that is just ripe for some real examination for me. I remember such that stuff so clearly. That's an angle that's been lurking the whole time, right? But they haven't quite delved in like they should, and bringing in this whole basketball team as like a Greek chorus of douche is... Uh, <laughs> is a strong move bring that Could guy be. the star of the team yeah the star of the team kind of acting as a uh you can't help but think of you know steve was kind of on top of the world when this show started mm-hmm. um he was mr popular all this stuff and now he's working at a video store and his best friend seems to be a girl who plays the trumpet in the band that's quite a departure from <laughs> season one episode one lovelessly banging young ladies of hawkins He's doing it. Let's take a break here. And what we'll do on the other side, we'll talk to Obi-Wan. Everyone, we are the podcast for TV and movie-loving folks who need to hear some thoughts. So subscribe to us. Follow us. Uh, we're, our main stuff is housed with the Alabama Take on social media. Every Friday morning, if you are subscribed, which you should be because it's free. It's on your podcast app. Just go, subscribe, click on that check mark or whatever it is these days. It's our newest entry to our family of podcasts, and that's Alabama Slam, where hosts Patrick Akers and Corey Hanna cover the world of pro wrestling. That's a must-listen if you enjoy wrestling. Uh, Patrick did his time in small indie circuits of wrestling, so he's got the knowledge you need, and Corey is a super fan. Good stuff. Coming in June will be the third season of This Song Sucks with host Josh Cavanaugh and Hayden Crawford saying horrible things about horrible people and horrible music. It's just horrible all the way around, but you, you'll love it. Hey, we got new staff writers on board, and they are doing some really great stuff, one of whom made his debut recently, Ty Edmondson. We'll get a lot of movie coverage. Arlie Oldacre will also be covering a lot of movies as well as uh, writing some stuff on past films that you might know and love. So stay on board with the site by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok. That's all at the Alabama Take. Laura is still continuing reviewing, discussing books. Patrick Akers, as I mentioned before, still continues to write a lot of interesting stuff, a lot of poignant essays. Coming this summer are two things that you will find related to the Alabama Take. You'll get the second season of Short Takes. That's coming. A lot of Fridays in this summer, our YouTube show will short takes will be on air and another podcast will reveal more about it the title check your shelf can you guess what it's going to cover hopefully so stay tuned online follow us online and you won't be confused by any of this stuff at all and say hello to us there let's get back into taking it down so no no spoilers at all but uh i want you to comment on the brilliance of challenge producers one of the only, and I'll, I'll tell you what I'm asking here. One of the only drawbacks of the Challenge All Stars for its first two seasons, it's airing its third season now on Paramount Plus, is it had this easygoing, laid back air of friendship throughout the cast and competitors. And what did they do? They just 
they said, you got to sabotage someone now. And they said, they added more people to who decides on who's going into elimination. So that heightens the drama. I couldn't agree with everything you just said more. I mean, you summed it up that they took a like a reunion show, basically. And between those twists and upping the level of the competitors. I mean, this is like, especially on the guy's side, this is prime competition. There's only a few folks from the quote-unquote main show that you would bring on, right, to make it more interesting mm-hmm. to me. Your Jordans and your your Wes's and, you know, Durrell's and all these guys are uh, are still heavy hitters. They would still do well in the main program. And do. And do. And Any- so I think getting all the all the gameplay things that you just mentioned seem like they start from a very simple place you know they wanted like the simplest game that moved the quickest so they could get these people with real lives in and out of a location in just a few weeks instead of like two months or whatever it can be for the main show them kind of tweaking that and it's also a return to classic format where it's not this convoluted voting system blah 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 if you're the worst one that day you're going in but like you said, adding the committee so that other people have to get their hands dirty and the winners have to sabotage, this is great. I love it. I mm-hmm. think this is a great format. Any qualms about what a few people are griping about online is that they're, some of these competitors are just not old enough to be quote-unquote all-stars, like, like Jordan is really seems a little young for the crew. Jordan and Kayla and Kayla Sylvia definitely. and a few others are definitely... I mean, Kayla's not 30 yet, if I have my math right or she will be this year so that's a little wow she's unfair i think for the for the rest of the folks you know there's a you got mark who's 50 yeah yeah i mean as she said it wouldn't have been mark wouldn't have had to be particularly young to be her (laughs) her dad a little a little weird but and especially jordan uh you know at least wes has been out of the game a little bit longer or off and on i suppose and has a career and all this stuff and Mm -hmm. But Jordan is, uh, he's 31, I think, maybe 32. He's still in the thick of his triathlete days, you know? He's still still in his prime. So that's tough competition for guys that are a good bit older. Challenge All-Stars, a little more another challenge show that's airing. But I'm fine with that, Uh, mostly. That first season where they, that the first competition, the first daily, when they just looked so out of shape. And so it was like when they had to run in the water and retrieve the thing and bring it back. And it was almost like like a slapstick comedy routine of, like, you just feel bad. Like that they're being asked <laughs> to do something this hard. From season one? Season one, yeah. Day one. And everybody said this is, time is a cruel, cruel thing. But that would have been hard on any... Even the main cast, I think, would have struggled with that. But, yeah, it's changed quite a bit from there. I and mean, it just feels like the main show now. There's some old school... You know, really, the only thing you have is the the old rivalries and then trying to work through those. It's much less this, like, kids getting back, like a high school reunion or something, you know? It's a, it's a competition. We're limited on time a little, but we'll, we're going to go through the other huge show, almost event level. It's on Disney+. Plus. It's the long-awaited Obi-Wan Kenobi. And unlike Netflix, Disney opts for a once-a-week release, except for the two episodes it released this Friday. Did that recap for Obi-Wan Kenobi that started the show, did that get you hyped? What a recap. What a, a little Phantom Menace footage always yeah. gets me hyped. <laughs> Other than the reminder that Jar Jar exists. I think that 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 recap was just like had me invested yeah i mean i think this goes back to maybe the things that we've complained about with the the latter movies that you know the the prequels are much aligned and fairly so but at least there was some significant world building and character development attempted Mm -hmm. uh even when it came off as as cheesy childish whatever (laughs) but yeah i mean having we'll get into having you and mcgregor back in the fold i'm sure but we're in the, the dead center of a story that we know and love with a character yeah. that we know and love. High stakes. It's just prime for success. Star Wars existed for me in, in fantasy for most of my life, but that's that opening, the reminder of Order 66 for the first episode, yeah. kind of could have used a little bit of a warning like Stranger Things added last minute. Mm. I mean, that was... yeah kind of intense for a star wars it was i mean the that depiction in the movie was 
was pretty intense as well. A lot of it's kind of off camera, though, in the movie. I thought That's that true. This was a little bit more on camera. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they they showed the actual adult Jedi being surrounded and killed and the kids running, right? Which is still super intense, but there's that long sequence in the movie where they, they show the stormtroopers turning on them all across the galaxy mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and taking them out. So that fires up the the imagination. It's, I guess, one of our darker impulses to be imaginative mm-hmm. about, but uh, it sets the stage and the stakes for... Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's a reminder of why he's hiding in a cave. The stakes are wonderfully set. I, I say that, and I say it here, I've said it a couple of weeks, I feel like, that it helps me so much as a viewer to see how dark it was for these characters. Well, you said it. Why, you know, when, when I watched A New Hope as a kid, why is he hiding in a cave? They say it, but I didn't grasp it. And seeing Order 66, yeah. again, helps a lot. It's basically episode one is Obi-Wan as Boo Radley. Yeah. Episode two is Obi-Wan as the protagonist of Taken, which is odd because that's Liam yeah. Neeson. <laughs> what did you feel about the two episodes? I thought they were great. I thought that they were a reminder of how good Ewan McGregor is at his job, uh, for one. I know we've praised different folks who've been in the expanding Disney Plus version of the Star Wars universe for being... Uh, wonderful actors but I mean this is like a different level in my mind at least uh, it helps that he's playing one of the the original characters that made it so strong I mean I, I joked with y'all that it could be him just out in the desert doing some mystic shit and I would watch <laughs> eight nine ten episodes whatever happily well that's the thing he's not right he's he's given up on that that that's going to lead to death um, instead he's just doing grunt work taking home a piece me, of meat at the end of every day. It's almost even more monastic what he's doing, which, you know, the, mm-hmm. him in the first, his first appearance in A New Hope is, I mean, he's supposed to be a monk coming in out of the desert, you know, mm-hmm. the way he's dressed, the way he's revealed all these things. And they really drive that home that when he needed to, he just accepted this humble life if it meant watching over Luke and even his resistance in the first episode, but definitely in the second, to using the Force to do anything. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Now, all that was played, written and played so well for me. Watching him have to work in like a meat packing place assembly line, mm-hmm. right? And mm-hmm. sneaking food out every day. I kept waiting for the... Something's going to happen with the food supply for his... <laughs> his uh, his space camel, right? Alien camel. Because uh, he cuts that, that piece of meat and puts it in his his cloak there, and he puts a knife away too, and at some point something's going to go down with that. I thought it was I thought it was great. What a flip. We've got another fantasy show, you know, Stranger Things we just got done talking about, but McGregor doing such subtlety in a fantasy show. I kept thinking to myself, how's he playing this? How's he, what's he, what's he doing here? And I loved thinking that. I loved watching him and, and, going through my mind there's a couple things going on here in his mind that i'm not getting that's not on the page which is great the way that he's playing that like you're talking about where you're never totally sure or you think there's more complex things going on in his head than are being spoken or you know acted out that gives every i mean i keep using the words like the stakes are high or like it's has more weight to it than these other Mm -hmm. shows did but it just feels more, you know, there was an element to the original Star Wars, and this is, people may roll their eyes at this, where the characters, so especially Obi-Wan, is like this admirable guy that you can, is this wise old man that you can learn something from, right? And so seeing him portrayed on screen as this thoughtful middle-aged guy who is going through something, mm-hmm. it just has so much more gravitas I guess than you know even a show like The Mandalorian which I enjoy that's it's just kind of like a fun adventure you know what I mean this has sure. some of the the weight that I think got people hooked originally on the first three films I agree good casting for the young Leia I thought you know child actors can go one way or the other and here 
I didn't expect Young Lay to play a role in this. I hadn't done a lot of spoiler research at all. So nice surprise that she's getting some things to do because it's not hurting the show at all to have her play against Ewan McGregor. Child actor's always risky, but she's she's playing it with the exact right amount of sass. <laughs> mm-hmm. A good idea to release two episodes because that first episode really just sets up the second one and lets you lets you into what's kind of what's going to happen, takes you off of tattooing and stuff. The idea that someone would be faking Jedi tricks to make money is so logical. It's something you wouldn't get in a movie. You wouldn't have time for. So that's taking advantage of the, of what you are giving the audience. We're going to do a six episode series. We've got a we got a moment to have Kamel Najiani <laughs> of all people to faking Jedi. The cottage industry of the Empire. All the ways to take advantage of people in these back channels, yeah. Yeah, you gotta do what you gotta do. The dead-end drug girl that approaches Ewan McGregor in the in the street of the mm-hmm. uh, very Tokyo-looking... That's actually Ewan McGregor's daughter, I think. And, oh, wow. Yeah. They tried to make it obvious, but that was Tamara Morrison as a gri- grizzled clone trooper. You know, he plays Boba Fett and, and all the... Mm other because right. you know they're, they're cloned off of him uh second episode even has a reverse shot of kenobi bending to plead with leia as leia been bended to plead as an adult to r2d2 v you know to ben kenobi via r2d2 anyway and her uh, young leia's green costume mirrors her look on indoor lots of things going on like that which took me yeah a lot to catch there is some fanboy complaining online about how the Grand Inquisitor supposedly dies five years into the future on another show. Um, Bad Batch, maybe? Something like that? One of the animated fanboys. series? Yeah. And they're like, well, he's not really dead because he's got it. And they're uh, complaining about the character of R- R- Reva, the third sister, getting a leg up on the Grand Inquisitor. Like, that would never happen. He would have shot her down. He would have taken care of her as soon as she would have snapped at him. I do have questions about the willingness that all of these people have to go after Obi-Wan. Knowing that, especially if they know how Anakin became Darth Vader. You know, like, Obi-Wan put him in that medical tube. (laughs) You know, like, this is, if the baddest dude in the Empire the guy who's kind of running the show on the ground scares the shit out of you, then this is a guy who beat him up. Shouldn't you be like a little more hesitant about chasing him into abandoned cargo ship areas? That's another message board chatter that you, that you might see is supposedly what only the emperor knows who Darth Vader really is. Like how is this third sister? How does she know? Mm. Where is she getting her information? Who okay. is she? That's like a big arguing point for those who uh, are really deep in the Star Wars mythos. I don't know if that's going to be a plot point or not. It all builds to the last image of Hayden Christensen opening his eyes in the in the tank. That's some that's some good shit. He's back. I mean, that is that's the good shit. Especially the way McGregor's eyes are revealing a lot in just the shot before. And then mm-hmm. flip to Vader opening his eyes. That's great. The, ta- the tank doesn't heal Vader completely, does it? Just too much to heal? Is that what's happening? Yeah, he's constantly being uh, watched over by his suit, right? I mean, that's that's how that works. It can't. He's never fully... It's been 10 years. He still looked pretty bad. Yeah. I mean, when we see him at the end of Return of the Jedi, and he's... What? Is he just old? Is he just... Is, is that due to his injuries previously? Yeah, we, I thought that was always, or I always thought that that was a lot of scarring and that kind of stuff. But I guess you see him in the uh, the weird chamber thing in the Empire Strikes Back, right? Doesn't he have like his medical thing that they approach a few times and his helmet is being put on by the robot and all this stuff. So his, his treatment is ongoing. Not the tank that, it's not the water tank that heals you, though. He's just kind of in a meditation chamber of sorts. I don't know. I've always been interested in that. Some some of this is a little too detail, detailed than uh, we tend to get into. It's a little bit of the yeah. 
dare I say, fanboy stuff. I, but I, it's the kind of thing I thought about as a kid, too. That's, uh, wow, I'm excited to watch a lot more of Obi-Wan. I could have digested two or three more episodes of this, whereas with Stranger Things, I was done after two episodes. It's like, nah, I need a break from this because I'm going to... I'm not in, I'm not going to enjoy it if I watch another one. Same. And I think this is the Obi-Wan is the most excited that I've been for any of these Disney Plus Star Wars installments for all the reasons that we just got into. Uh you may have really hit on why it is so appealing to me with your last statement about like this is getting into the stuff that the questions that I had in childhood. You know, like all those details you like to imagine that they have answers. And so all the questions that you would have asked of the first three films. And now this is kind of exploring those, uh, those unknowns in a, to me, pretty through two episodes, pretty satisfying way uh, that maybe other shows and even movies miss the mark on. So I was super excited. I'm with you too on the, the comparison to stranger things, both times that a strain, the first two episodes ended I just said out loud, this show's wild. <laughs> I don't really know what's going on here. Whereas Kenobi is a little bit more cohesive. They got more mythos to play with, I suppose. How big of a metaphorical yeah. boner are you going to get when Kenobi finally fires up a lightsaber? Man, they were teasing it the entire time. His hands <laughs> I was on just it. Like, just, I mean, even him. Just fire the son of a bitch up, man. Even in the desert, man, nobody's watching. Just turn it on, <laughs> let it make the noise. That's the thing, though. He knows if he practices any of that shit, they're going to be on him. They'll sense him. Vader will open his eyes, you know. As soon as he started getting in that headspace, Vader was like, what? Totally. Even them playing with, like, little Leia saying, make me float. You know, that was a funny... Yeah. Like, of course a kid would, like, say that immediately. Yeah, yeah. make you know? me fly. Like, here's a... Make me fly. And then he does... And, you know, you, you mentioned some of the stuff they're doing with the reverse of him talking to her, like she eventually talks to R2 and her green cloak and all this stuff. It really drives home again to fanboy out. Uh, when she says, help me Obi-Wan Kenobi, you're my only hope in the first one. Mm -hmm. She's mm -hmm. got really good reason to believe that because we know that they both survive what's happening in these episodes. How pumped did this show make me? I'll tell you. I went back and watched those last 10 to 15 minutes of Rogue One. Mm. I was like, I've got to have something. You know, you, you've... I'm not satiated. I need something. More Obi-Wan probably in the future. We're going to talk that Wilco album next week. Join us. Subscribe to us. That's it for this week. Again, uh, our news and all Alabama tape related things are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. You can follow us there. We at this show, Taking It Down, will be back every Tuesday morning, except for a couple planned weeks off here and there. Let us know what we should talk about. I think we're kind of, we know where we're going next couple of weeks. Join us. It's fun. 